Estamos gravando, então, uh, Heavy Culture Talk, agora uh, a nossa live não conseguiu, não conseguimos por questões técnicas, estamos aqui com Perry Strickland, Violence. Welcome! Welcome! Nosso talk especial, então, com o lendário batera do Violence Trash Metal Bay Area, e a gente vai falar rapidinho com com, com o Perry, tirar umas dúvidas, falar sobre o novo lançamento da banda, e eu já vou lascar uma perguntinha para a gente aproveitar esse momento aqui bacana, né? Eu queria falar do EP Let the World Burn, que foi lançado aí em março, né? E parece que a banda foi muito feliz em escolher o título, né? O mundo tá, uhum. tá aí, tá, tá pegando fogo, né? A beira do caos, enfim, e o Violence voltou com força máxima aí, com, após um hiato aí de 30 anos, né? Como foi retornar? Então, a, a pergunta é, como foi retornar aí ao estúdio, né? O Perry, como tem sido essa repercussão? Enfim, se ele pudesse falar pra gente como é que tá essa nova fase do Violence. Ok. Uh, Jay was asking about the return of the band, ok? Let the world burn is like uh, amazing. It shows the band in full form again. And uh, how is it for you to be back after 30 years? and bringing back violence with the original violent sound, you know? <clears throat> it, was, uh, it was probably the most challenging um, thing I've probably ever experienced. I've, uh, I had taken probably 13 years off from playing drums and wasn't even playing anymore. I was racing motorcycles and uh, hanging out with all my buddies and, and uh, just loving life, right? Still love life, but I'm just saying, I just went a different direction. You know, the industry had kind of just uh, burnt me out. And uh, I just went my own way because I had control my own way, right? I go to work every day. I make my money. I pay my bills. I spend my money on what I want. I'm in control. And uh, I just did that. And uh, coming back was mostly about Sean. You know, Sean had his liver transplant. And... Uh, We all got together because I, I think if you've seen the pictures of Sean back then, you know, he was really close to death. And yeah. to be honest, I never, I, I didn't even think he'd make it. Um, but he is such a stubborn asshole that uh, not even death was going to get one on him. Yeah. Not yet, <laughs> you know, and um, it It just started off to like, hey, uh, I think Sean, when he was feeling better, asked Phil, you know, hey, do you want to, you want to, you know, do a show? And I think Phil's response was like, what, you mean like go to the movies? You know, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> and Sean was like, no, you know, I think I'd like to play a show. And, and so that came about that way. And it was, <clears throat> you know, it'd be really nice if we can somehow manage that, you know, and you can see him on that first show. He's still pretty frail. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> and uh, that's how it started, you know, and we just did the reunion show and um, it just blew up from there, you know, and uh, yeah. luckily Phil had a lot of free time or not really a lot of free time, but on the free time that he does have, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, he spent a lot of time with me. So I was really the reason it took so long. You know, because I had to learn how to write music again. I had to learn how to understand it again. Yeah. You know, and um, I mean, there were just days when I wanted to hit Phil right in the mouth and Phil would just turn his guitar off, put it down and go, "Okay, we're done for today. Because, you know, the both of us would get a little frustrated, but we, I think we did a good job of just stopping when it got to that point. Yeah. And we were really good at being able to reboot the next day, you know, like, okay. Yeah, you know, that was Monday, right. today's Tuesday. Let's, yeah. Let's and get talking back at it. And talking yeah. about the reunion, uh, when you came back, how do you see the new audience? Because the audience changed a lot from like the 80s, 90s, and now 2000s. It's a pretty different audience. Obviously, we had lots of uh, uh, guys from the 80s you know, going to the concert because of the importance of the band. But oh, it's, we have... Uh, a, a new audience it's like how do you see this um i i thought it was really cool you know i've never been in the scene 
you know, that was always Phil and Sean and Dean, and mm-hmm. they always were at the scene. I didn't really hang out at shows too much. I like them. It just wasn't my thing. Standing around all day was just not kind of my thing. I'm and uh, I always did my my own thing outside of music. And um, but what I noticed <clears throat> was that there were a lot of uh, older guys, my age, mature gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> who were showing up with their kids, right? Yeah. And that's so but funny. their kids aren't kids, right? Their kids are, you know, 30 years old, you know, 25. Yeah. You know, like my oldest is 36, you know. So um, <laughs> you would see that. And uh, that was kind of cool. And then when we went to uh, Mexico and we went to Puerto Rico and we went a bunch of other places and um, there is a rejuvenation, you know, and I think it's been so long. I almost think everything came around full circle again. Yeah. And um, I think, I think people can still appreciate its rawness. You know, there's not a lot of digital stuff going on. You know, it's yeah. still five guys throwing their instruments up on stage and just getting down, you know, and um, it's been a blessing for me because it really gives a, me a place to release all my anger. And, yeah. um, and it, I forgot how much fun it was to beat a drum set like it owes me money. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> I'm very happy to have you play in again because, you know, Violence is one of the most important bands too in the trash metal scene in the 80s. You know, it's like, uh, it was a pity when the band ended up and it's great to have the band again. Uh, it's yeah, like it's, jamming it's and for the you know, audiences. We, back in the day, we just, we couldn't keep a label happy. Um, everything we did was a mountain to climb you know and uh yeah i think after about 10 years of that it was just like oh you know yeah. another label oh we got to get another label it was like uh guys the world just doesn't want us to survive and uh, yeah and, uh, yeah so, yeah i i think there's something linked to like violence was a little bit ahead of the other band so it was different at the same time so it was like not so commercial as it should be or something like that Maybe. because in the night because in the night as we had that frustration with fresh metal and everything was becoming grungy and things like that so yeah yeah i mean i remember that i remember when grunge came out it's like oh look at how they're dressed it's like what are you talking about we've been dressing <laughs> like that for 15 years already you know what's yeah. the big deal you know? <laughs> I mean, when you were a kid, it was always denim jeans and a flannel shirt, you know, and mismatched socks, you know? I mean, yeah. And if you were lucky, you had a dollar fifty in your pocket to buy a corn dog at 7-Eleven and feed yourself, you know? And so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you can just turn that commercial, I think, and then, like, and yeah. the 80s, it wasn't commercial. It was, like, just a way of living. Like, more. Yeah. Yeah, right. The early 80s, yeah, it was just, Yeah. I would yeah. say so. You know, I okay. didn't pay attention to a lot of it when I was younger. You know, I just was doing, like, I think a lot of young people do. You know, you're just doing your own thing. Yeah. You know, so to reflect back on it is probably a little unclear because it's uh, my own, whatever I was going through compared to what was happening. And so that can be a little jaded, you know, yeah. as opposed to having a very clear, unbiased view. Yeah. <laughs> okay. George is going to ask another question now. Sure. Okay, George, vai. Uh, a gente falou aí do trash metal, né? Como como eles veem hoje o Violence, uh, né? O Perry vê hoje a cena trash, né? As novas bandas que foram uh -huh. foram influenciadas pelo pelo Exodus, por, pelo Violence, como como uh, hoje a, 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 ele enxerga essa, essa cena trash com, os, com a velha guarda interagindo aí, hum. vivendo com a nova, né? Com a nova geração, isso está sendo legal? Como é que eles estão enxergando isso? Ok, uh, George is asking about the new trash metal scene, okay, the bands that were influenced by Exodus, by Violence, and other trash metal bands from the 80s, and this interaction of the old bands and the new bands, because all the old bands are, some are still playing, Violence is coming back, so there is kind of an interaction between two different ages, we can say that. It's like, uh, there is a revival, from the new yeah. bands. They're, they're trying to revive the 80s style. And at the same time, we have the bands from the 80s playing again. How yeah. do you see this, this, this thing happening? 
Well, I seem to notice that a lot of the new, there's a resurgence of that um, garage band type thing, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think when I was leaving the music scene, you know, everybody had gone to IT school. You know, you went to the Institute to play guitar. You went to the Institute to play drums. Well, I never did none of that. You know, I went to high school and I played jazz band or I played in a marching band. Uh, and we mostly just played in the garage yeah. constantly. You know, I mean, Phil would play his guitar in the quad with all the other guys playing guitar in the quad in high school, you know. And you got together and you tried as hard as you could to put a cover together, right? And then you would kind of piece something together from there. And um, I think Phil and I would always make music when we were younger. The hardest part was finding a singer, right? You know, yeah. and uh, <laughs> or finding someone who could write music, you know, vocally, you know. And yeah. uh, I see the I see the new generation of a lot of people like that, which is kind of refreshing because you can see that, OK, this stuff is being made in the garage. This is all being done by feel, you know, and your ear. And instead of trying to say, well, you know, I'm going to digitize this and I'm going to play, I'm going to write all the music and I'm going to play all the instruments and I'm going to sing and I'm going to tap dance at the same time. It's like, yeah, would you just let the band <laughs> be a band, you know, and um, yeah, I think with us as violence when we were younger, nobody ever told anybody else what to do. You know, Sean did Sean, Phil did Phil. I did whatever I wanted. And, um, it, it just worked, you know, Great. this time we really worked this, this last record we just did was, uh, there was so much writing and rewriting and, um, that it was difficult. You know, I had a, I had a big yeah. learning curve, you know, and, uh, luckily for me, I was blessed to be working with some great people. And, uh, luckily I'm Phil and I have a long relationship and, uh, and thank God Phil wanted me to be there and wanted it to happen because uh, yeah, it, we got pretty frustrated at some points. But uh, if you want to do something well, it's not easy, right? Yeah. So, nothing and how, easy. how is the reception of this album? Like, uh, how do you see the people talking about this new album? Because I like... can't believe how, how good it's going over. You know, I mean, and then, uh, you know, like Upon the Cross, you know, when, when when we were writing that, you know, I mean, Phil was like, yes. I don't know if that's a violent song, you know, whatever. And I like, you know, well, let's just write it. You know, it's writing it. It wrote itself really quickly somewhat, yeah. you know, and uh, and then, you know, we're like, OK, you know, it's fairly simple. And we did that. And uh, then Sean came in with the lyrics. And we started tightening that up and it was like, oh man, you know, that just that slow crunch. And um, I really dug it. I was like, wow, you know, yeah, we haven't really done a lot of that, you know? So uh, I really liked it, you know? And I was like, I, it was neat to have a, a, a little bit more diversity and yeah. really broaden that scope a little bit. And I think that's okay as long as you do it right. And, um, you know, I think, the music might have slowed down, but Sean didn't change, right? Sean is still just, you know? and, uh, <laughs> and uh, so it, it it makes it violence. You know, as soon as Sean opens his mouth, it makes it violence. Yeah, you know, he could sing lullabies and it would still be violence. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the best part of it, you know, like yeah. uh, uh, listening to violence being violence again. It's like, yes, it's yeah, amazing. And then okay. of course, you know, we got Christian. And uh, we have Bobby, you know, and yeah. uh, man, I couldn't be in a better band to go around the world and start doing some damage. You know, <laughs> and they're both like, <laughs> Christian stays at my house and Bobby stays at my house when we practice. And, uh, you know, it is, you know, like Phil always says, hey, how's Camp Perry? You know, because we're <laughs> always just hanging out in the patio and just uh, have a great, it's, it's truly an amazing good time and uh great i'm happy to be here yeah we are happy to have you back <laughs> that's the point okay jorge pode fazer a pergunta uh, falando agora da formação recente né com a uh -huh. uh, uh, com o bob gustafson né ex overkill aí no lugar do rob flynn né eu acho que foi uma excelente escolha né o uh -huh. 
pessoal da Beária realmente, quando promove as mudanças, uh, uh, é feliz, né? O, o Bob se encaixou perfeitamente com o Violence. Sim. E como está sendo aí essa versão aí, do, como é que está sendo essa versão, essa line-up, né? Essa nova line-up com o Bob nas guitarras. Ok. Uh, George is asking how is it to be playing with Bob Gustafsson on the guitars? Like, the difference between, like, two guitar players and things like that. So we want to talk about the Godfather. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Bobby and I have been friends probably since the late 80s, you know, and uh, uh, there are just some things because I'm, you know, I some people will say I'm difficult to be around and then my best friends would say I'm the easiest to be around. Uh, Bobby and I always just clicked, you know, as friends. You know, before yeah. we even played a note, you know, and uh, when I left violence in 93, Bobby and I were working on a band with Billy Milano. And we were trying to get that together. Obviously, you know, it didn't work out. It fell through. But um, that's where we started our musical journey together, you know, and. Uh, when it when we got did the reunion, um, we just <clears throat> we wanted to go a little bit different direction. And we needed a little bit better player. And um, Bobby was just the perfect fit. Yeah. And uh, and more than that, you know, he's my he's my one of my my closest friends, you know. So I get to play this, this phenomenal guitar player who's actually one of my close friends. And it, it, uh, it if you're going to go around the world at my age and you're going to do these things and you're going to travel and you're going to be alone in hotel rooms and on planes and, you know, doing all these things, which people don't have any idea how much work that is, you know, so yeah. an hour show took three days to make happen because we had to fly there, rest, set up, you know, whatever. And uh, it's good to be with your boys, man. People have yeah. your back, people you enjoy being around, you know, yeah. God forbid you had to do all that with somebody you didn't like. <laughs> and it's totally different than paying someone to be with you playing, you know? Yeah. Like I just, I just like that, you know, we get along, you know, we're like, hey, you know, it, it's just very, very cool. Same yeah. with Christian, you know, Christian, I clicked with Christian the first second he got into the studio. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you know, I would say I'm probably the worst musician out of this whole band by far. I mean, by, by far, you know, and uh, Bobby, Phil and Christian really make me sound great and yeah. really make me uh step up another level that you know yeah. i wouldn't otherwise do so. yeah bob is a fantastic guitar player you can see by overkill and things like that you know like yeah. and and this fusion is amazing like fusing like overkill and violence together and uh keeping the essence of the band together too yes you know, I, I i i think that's the chemistry as we talk you know because you already played together it didn't work but you have the chemistry to to do it work now and that's yeah. the best part of it i think like uh, that, yeah i mean and if you listen to the guitar solos on the cp um bill and bobby are just shredding i mean i'm listening to the solos and i'm like you know oh i'm usually playing so i don't always you know i'm not always hearing every note yeah i, I, like, I, I, I hear it but i don't always hear yeah. it. And, uh, you know when you sit down and you really listen to it and you just go wow you guys are smoking, man. It's just like, <laughs> wow. And uh, I think they complement each other really, really well. You know, which is, I mean, how lucky can you be? <laughs> <laughs> Great. So. Bye, George. Ok, next. Uh, eu tava pesquisando aqui no Spotify, eu ia, eu ia, eu ia falar do, do Pressing the Masses, não tá no Spotify. Sim. E eu acabei de ver aqui, nem o Eternal Nightmare tá no Spotify. Isso aí é um... <risos> isso aí... É... Como, é... Como é que eles estão lidando com isso? Porque o Pressing the Masses agora, eu, 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 eu escuto no YouTube e é um vinil. E outra coisa, não tem um, um, uma, uma previsão de relançar o vinil, porque esse vinil eu procuro há 20 anos, cara. Ah, eu não consigo é... encontrar. <risos> isso é música branca, meu filho. O Pressing, o Pressing the Masses em vinil... E não tem mais nenhum álbum, os dois álbuns clássicos estão fora da, da, do streaming. O uh -huh. que, que aconteceu? Please. Ok. Uh, George is asking about 
Spotify because he can find uh, violence on Spotify and more like uh, oppressing the masses and the second album they're not there and also he is asking about if there is a possibility of repressing uh, oppressing the masses because it's vinyl. impossible to on vinyl because it's impossible to find as one you know it, it, it became a white fly you know you can see it flying right. everywhere right. <laughs> Well, I know I know the phone calls have been going in every day to Atlantic Records to try and find it and yeah. uh, to try and get them to release it. And um, like right now, they took Eternal off of Spotify. And I think it's because it's switching to our new label. You yeah. know, so our catalog will be all on the same label. From what I understand, I believe that's what's happening. And yeah. so I believe that they're trying at this point to get the whole catalog onto one label. Yeah. Um, and so that would make it easier and we can get it on Spotify and iTunes and everything like that. You know, because they, you know, we still owe them money. So it would be great if they could put the record out so we can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it would be great because you have a new album and it's like uh, doing some noise. And then it, it's good to repress the old ones because they're repressing everything now. So why not yeah. to repress violence? And we, they're, we're, hey, we're all for it. It's just uh, no one's answering the phone at Atlantic. So we're trying to get that going. Yeah, you know that's because, out of my that's out of my control. <laughs> yeah, but it's yeah. not like something. Oh, I'm gonna repress that. That's cheap. No. <laughs> well, you think why not? While it's hot, make some money, right? Yeah. So you would think they would do it on that note because that's all they're about anyway. So why not press? You can't make any money if you don't press the record. So yeah, yeah. because it's like uh, uh, oppressing the masses is like a uh, very important. Uh, it's like and having it uh, like. Most of the guys who listened to it in the 80s and most of the guys who could get a copy of it in the 80s because the time we didn't have like vinyl like flying, flying sorry, everywhere and things like that. It was difficult. Mainly here in Brazil, it was pretty difficult to find uh, a vinyl. We had the cassettes because we yeah. traded with people, you know, like uh, waiting one, two months for a letter to come and say like, oh, here, it's like the new album. And then you had a second album and it's like, ah. Eh? <laughs> Yeah, right. Well, you know, that, that time zone, too, was also, um, everything was changing. You know, you had records, cassettes, yeah. then you had a CD, uh, you know, now everything's just digital. So there's, you know, you can repress it, but you yeah. also could just release it, you know, and we're yeah. having difficulties just getting it released from the uh, Atlantic so we can uh, put it on Spotify at the very least, right? Yeah. Yeah, because so, lots yeah. of people Trust are me, going to. There's nobody who wants that album released more than us. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and in Brazil too. <laughs> lots yeah. of people. O Dudu, du eu ouvi no YouTube, cara. Eu tenho que escutar o Pressing the Masses no YouTube. Fala pro Pérez. <laughs> George is complaining that it's like very hard to listen to Pressing the Masses in on YouTube through YouTube. <laughs> yeah, or someone's live version on their phone, right? It's like yeah, yeah, yeah like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we we even thought about going in and maybe re-recording it or doing something like that. It's just, uh, yeah, repressing. I don't, I don't know if that would ever work. You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's to get everybody back together to do that yeah. would be difficult. And uh, yeah, but it, like, see what happens because there, you know, you have Rob wrote, Phil wrote, Sean. Yeah. We all put it together, so you know. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> yeah, you have, you but have, you have some of those little boundaries and issues, and you know, I'm sure yeah. Phil will work it out if he can. And yeah. Phil and Sean usually take care of all the business parts because you don't need more than two cooks in the kitchen. So, yeah, that's how we do it. Yeah, and oppressing the masses really deserves a repress. It's like, yeah, really, album. really, probably, really do. It was probably my favorite album up until the EP. Yeah, like you know, now you have. The to. The EP is by far my favorite of any any work yeah. I've ever done. Yeah, so, it's great. Uh, well, it's just it's just fun to play. I yeah, mean, when uh, I sit down in my studio at my house, it's just fun to play. I can't wait to throw the headphones on and bash yeah. it out. You know, yeah. and my neighborhood's great. All my neighbors are like, "Yeah, yeah. you know, fifty-six <laughs> yeah. year old heavy metal drummer, go get him." You know? like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and one but thing that's how old I am. Yeah, 
We, and one thing that's great about technology is the fact now it's easier to spread the word about the AP than it was like in the 80s and the 90s, you know, like that's the good thing about technology, you know, like we don't have the yes. AP like a vinyl on ends, but we can reach it faster than the old days. The old days was really difficult to reach something, you know, you have to wait. And... Well, it seems funny because, you know, remember like in the, in the mid 80s, you know, when you were tape trading. Yeah, right? and you were making your copy on your TDK that sounded like garbage, but you still had it. Yeah, right. Like I, you know, I probably you know, uh, geez, I had rust. You know, you you'd have it. You know that TDK tape, right? That had probably been recorded over like a thousand times, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that is, just the most god awful sound ever. But you know what? Still loved it because I had my metal on my on my yeah. tape. <laughs> You know, and now, now everything's digital. So, you know, I mean. Yeah. Yeah, but now they are releasing tapes again. So. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, <laughs> you can't beat digital. I mean. Yeah. You know, I don't think, you know, in, in my car, my vet, I have, you know, a really nice sound system. Yeah. And uh, and I just do it with my phone, which I'm, you know, yeah, I'm not really, as prison. you guys know from our technical difficulty before, that I'm not too <laughs> phone savvy. Yeah. <laughs> but you know like, it's really amazing to just you know i with bluetooth you only have to plug your phone in you just press play it syncs up and it just sounds amazing it's like wow this wow technology is good when it comes to that yeah you know? this is this is the best part of it you know yeah we can I mean, enjoy you have your own playlist so you can just like spotify roam in your metal yeah. category and i'm listening to everything from exumer to uh you know to yeah. testament to slayer to uh you know excel and uh you know and just bouncing all over the place yeah. and it's awesome you know yeah. because i would never otherwise have that many tapes in the back of my car to put in this player yeah right <laughs> <laughs> you know? yeah but, i i remember when they first released the walk man remember that we could oh, yeah. go out we listening to the song and then we well, had a band to 120 minute <laughs> TDK tape, right? Oh, and that was a reverse. So you just go, yeah, days, just days. <laughs> no uh, batteries. With Exodus in 89, um, you know, that's how I learned. You know, they called me one day, said, Hey, we need you to fly out tomorrow and, and do the Headbangers Ball Tour. So I was like, Yeah. You know, Gary's like, Do you know the music? And I lied. I said, Yeah, <laughs> I know all of it. I know it all. Like, back of my head, I didn't know none of it. And uh, I put that. Oh, I put the whole set list over and over on 120 minute TDK and they put my Walkman on for like a day and a half while I flew out to Texas and and uh and that's how that's how it was done back in the day, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Okay, vai lá, Josh. Todo mundo fala do, do da, das guitarras do Violence, né, que uh -huh. que realmente, né, tinha um trabalho foda, tem ainda, né? Mas o, o, o trabalho do Perry também chamou atenção. Acho que ele, eu acho que ele é um dos bateras que mais bate forte na Bay Area. Né? Ele tem uma pegada super forte. E eu queria entender qual é a influência dele como músico, né? E, uhum. e, enfim, ele tem um trabalho muito bacana. Okay, uh, George was talking about the guitar work on violence and things like that, but he says that your work is also very important because you have one of the strongest beat and the by <laughs> area scene, you know, like, uh, and he wants to know, like, who are your influences for the drums, you know, because you really have a strong beat, you know, in um, your drumming. <laughs> well, you know, obviously, as a younger kid, uh, there were a lot of jazz influences. Um, my father had a lot of friends in the Bay Area, you know, like as far as um, some of them played in Santana, you know, and um, we'd go over on Christmases or whatever, and the kids would all, they'd be jamming, right? They'd just be jamming in the basement, having yeah. a great time. And as kids, you would walk through and they'd hand you, you know, a cowbell, give you a little bongo drum, right? And say, oh, sit down and play, you know, and they just let you make yeah. noise. And um, watching some of those guys play was really inspirational because I got to watch a percussion section. You know, it wasn't just watching a drummer. It was watching a whole percussion section just come together and just do all this yeah. kind of stuff. And then I'd go to school and I'd play in jazz bands and all that stuff. As I got a little older, got more into like Pat Benatar, you know, and consider the year. 
that that came out right i was pretty i was still kind of some hard rock right you know it wasn't yeah <laughs> and uh, the police right like Stuart copeland i was yeah. a really big fan of his um people might listen to the police and go i don't get it but if you ever watched Stuart copeland play yeah i mean he's huge you know he is a he was a monster on the drum set you know, he really was, even with traditional grip. I mean, I've never seen somebody with a traditional grip just yeah. hit so, so hard. And, you know, the traditional grip is to give you that finesse, you know. <laughs> he did, yeah. he did crap it. <laughs> and, uh, I used to love that because he took everything and he moved it one note to the left, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, okay, that's, that was <laughs> that's, interesting, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then, of course, high school. Kill 'em All was really great. Slayer was really great. But uh, the one who really just turned my whole my whole brain was probably Tom Hunting. Ooh. Yeah. Just um, the minute I, I watched him for the first time, it was a game changer. Yeah. You know, and there was something about his energy, um, his just brutal assault. Now, I watched Lars play. He was good, you know, really good. Loved it, you know. Uh, same with Dave Lombardo. But Tom just, it was like he didn't like his drum set. And it owed yeah. him money, you know. And he would just kill it. And there was just, the sound and the aggression matched the playing. Yeah. You know, like it just all lined up and it's like, I saw myself with a spot, like a home. And I was like, you know, I was very violent, very, uh, let's see, socially awkward. We'll just say yeah. that. So don't sound, you know, in and out of trouble and whatnot and doing stupid stuff I shouldn't do. And um, that was the door that opened. And I was like, wow, I, if I could focus my bullshit <laughs> and... <laughs> get that and, going yeah that was that was my slot and um that's what i tried to do and uh tom was and i tell him all the time you know because i talk yeah. to tom on the phone once in a while and, and uh tell him yeah it's probably one of my biggest inspirations drumming wise Great. for metal by far yeah <laughs> george pode perguntar aí é só pra... Plus, have you ever met tom what have you ever met him no, I didn't have the opportunity. Uh, I, I've had the opportunity to see Exodus alive, but he was not drumming that time. He's a, probably the coolest cat you'll ever meet. Yeah. I mean, he just, he's great. Great dude. So, even a better drummer. Yeah. Like, yeah. I remember the concerts, like oh, the tape concerts. The beginning with Paul Balaf, it was amazing to see him drumming. It was like, yeah. ah. <laughs> right. you got like men's going to destroy that drum kit, you know, for sure. Oh, and then, let's not forget Paul Bostaff, either. I mean, yeah. Um, <laughs> now, here's here's some real history. So, um, I think the first time I met Paul, we were probably in 10th or 11th grade, and uh, back in the day, we used to play in storage units because they were cheap, right? You could rent a 10 by 20 storage unit for a hundred bucks a month. Yeah. And, you know, we plug everything into like one socket. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> but uh, everybody, that's forbidden played down there and we played down there. And uh, and that's kind of how we all met and started doing shows, you know? And um, it's kind of neat to see all these people that are just doing, that are big, big in the business you know yeah. paul was a friend when we were in high school zetro and i went to high school together phil zet chuck billy we Ooh. all went to high school together willie lang you know from laws rocket who recently yeah. passed you know um we were all from dublin you know and there's a lot more that just came out of there and uh it i think the first tour we did with testament you know they brought their roadies and with us and it was like there were probably 10 people from our high school that were all with us, you know, either working <laughs> cool. or playing at some point. And it was like, wow, that doesn't just happen, you know. Yeah. It was kind of cool. You know, really remember cool. every minute of it. Yeah. So much fun. Yeah, great times. Yeah. 
A, a gente fala, a, a gente sempre fala dos álbuns clássicos aí o Eternal Nightmare e o Oppressed the Masses, mas agora eu quero ouvir do Perry uh, lembranças do tempo de Nothing to Gain. Uhum. O que que aconteceu nessa fase aí foi o início do fim, como o pessoal costuma falar. Quais as lembranças de dos tempos de Nothing to Gain? Uh, George is asking about your remembrances from the nothing to gain because that was like the beginning of the end for the violence, you know, like, well, as most people say. Yeah, well, you know, uh, the record labels were starting to go on, you know, because uh, grunge had come out, right? Yeah. And everybody was suffering. So uh, we were trying to get this album out and... Um, We wanted to go use, I definitely wanted to go use Alex Perry Alice again from Oppressing the Masses. Yeah. And uh, and and Rob Hunter, you know, Wacko, the drummer for Raven was our engineer. Yeah. Yeah. So imagine how fun that was, right? Uh, the label, for some reason, wanted us to use Michael Rosen. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We hmm. did not. I did not. I literally almost got in fist fights with him. <laughs> and it was everything like I'd have to just leave because I was going to just knock his teeth out and uh, we didn't we didn't work it didn't click and I think I did most of my tracks with Vinny who was our engineer and, uh, and um, that's when we really started butting heads you know and uh, it was just downhill from that because uh, the label wasn't was having their own issues uh We weren't recording well with this guy. Um, they were trying to interject more of like, can you guys do this? You know, send us demos, send us demos. And like, uh, look, we're just going to write the songs and you don't need demos. It's our third record by now. If you're not on yeah. board, you know, then you're not on board. And uh, we were trying to find something to give them. And it was always like, well, can you, Can you do the same thing but different? And it's like what? All right, you know, what? Just, you, know uh, you know, like Phil says, record label artist, record label artist. You know, yeah. And like, uh, uh, two different that really things. wasn't happening. And I think the rejection from all the labels and struggling with all that just kind of took a toll. It yeah. did for me, and I was just I'd had it. I just like you know, uh, I got no control over my life right now, and. Um, I just want to bail and I just want to go to work every day and, and buy a house and be normal and raise my kids and, and yeah. have some, uh, some structure that I can control. Yeah. And then we're happy out of control. <laughs> yeah. But we're happy that we came back and you were able to bring back the sense of violence. That's the most important thing. We're That's... all lucky to where we do well, you know, yeah. all of us have done really, really well, uh, outside of music. And so this time we're all in a better head space. We're all in a better financial space. Um, you know, I probably, I probably dropped like $10,000 just buying new kits and mics for the studio. And Christian and I would buy all this gear so we could record. I mean, we did Uber Alice in our studio. Christian yeah. did all that by himself. And, uh, and people are like, why'd you do a cover? It's like, well, You know, we wanted something that we could all work together on that was already written. You know, yeah. there's nothing to change. Just learn it. Yeah. Right? And record it. So we wanted to take the writing drama out of it, get in there and just record and have fun. You know, and yeah. I think we did that. And I had a blast. So Yeah, you really did it. <laughs> it was like It's great, as I said. It's gay. it's great to listen to violence sounding like violence again. This is like yes. amazing, and yeah, the is, oppor and the opportunity to see violence playing again, playing the old stuff too. It's like yes, like you know, <laughs> it's pretty yeah, good it, to have the band active again. I love it's like it. Yeah, I love sure. it. Sure. Yeah, Jay. Yeah, um, what a what a, what a blessing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so agora a última só para deixar aqui um spoiler para gente o EP Sim. o EP já tá tá fantástico mas a gente Sim. entende que talvez aí né a banda já está se preparando para o Funlente o que que ele pode nos adiantar disso uh -huh. por favor eu, 
Okay, so we have a last question for you. It's like uh, after the ZP, uh, are you planning something for a full length album? Something like uh, we need to release something and go back to the mainstream again? No, we're not planning yet. We're not planning on really anything. Yeah. You know, we want to do this record. I mean, I think, you know, Phil and I are still working. I think we're working on like, one song and Phil's, uh, Sean's working on lyrics for one new song already. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not putting anything on it. It'll just yeah. come out how it comes out. It might be a year, might be six months. We don't know. Okay. Um, I don't know if we'll ever do a full album again. Um, will there be new music? I think so. Yeah, great. But, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, our, our, I think a little bit of our philosophy is that, you know, I don't know if we need to do full records anymore because yeah. it would be, you know, I think it's better to just put out five songs. Yeah. That you put your heart and soul in and do a video and it allows you to focus on five new songs right after yeah. that. Right. Yeah. And I agree. It would allow us to be a little more current constantly. Yeah. As opposed to writing 10 songs, getting one video, nine songs just kind of, eh, you know, maybe not getting the, the love yeah. that you want them to. And um, we were, and, and we're just talking about it, you know, but we're like, it, yeah. it, it just, it, it works phenomenally. It wasn't yeah. too hard to record. Uh, it went rather smooth. And um, for us, we need everything to go smooth. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and know? I think, in my opinion, like the 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 EPs nowadays, they 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 fit perfectly for the market, for the band, and for and for the labels. And also, we have the technology to spread it as fast as the old days, you know. Right, right. And you know, when you when you download stuff digitally anyway, you're only downloading the ones you like anyway. Yeah. So you know, so <laughs> you know, if you're making uh, three or four songs that are B sides or. You know, you're like, wow, we killed these seven songs, but the other four are like, nah. You know, yeah. don't put, you know, we, yeah. we, we want to try to avoid that. Yeah, it's like it's better you know, to have. That's all. We're not trying to great, great sounds than having like a... We're just trying to avoid not putting out the best violence that we can put out. Yeah. You know, th those five songs we did were the best violence that we could put together. And yeah. uh, I'm very proud of it, uh, extremely proud of it. And, um, you know, it's Very like, happy. I'm lucky to be on the kickball team. You know, yeah. all the kids that were being picked <laughs> that could have been on this kickball team and they picked me to be on the kickball team. So, <laughs> lucky me. Very good. Yeah, Muito bom. Agradecer aí a presença do, do, do Perry Strickland na, no Habiculture Talk. Agradece para nós, Cristian, um prazer enorme eu ter falado com esse, essa lenda eu vou, do Trash. Eu vou fazer uma última pergunta também, vou agradecer. Vai lá. Like, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, just one question and then we can finish, okay? Like, is there any possibility of coming to Brazil to see violence playing? Because it's something yes. that... Oh, yeah, September! We're no, we're, yeah, right? I, I, I have to check with Sean's schedule, but yeah, we're coming. Yeah, that would September be great. <laughs> yeah, in fact, in fact when, I, when I... Um, I'll go through because I'm working today. So uh, when I go through the manifest, Sean will send me when he updates everything. I'll make yeah. sure I send you. Uh, I'll send you what we're doing in South America. Uh, but I think we're doing like six dates. You know, yeah. we were supposed to right when COVID came out, we were supposed to do, you know, the Netherlands, South America, all Brazil uh, yeah. and Japan. And oh. the day before we left, Japan pulled our passports. Uh, and nobody was going nowhere because of COVID. So, yeah, yeah, you know, and uh, we really just kind of want to make sure we're not going to cancel any more shows. Yeah. <laughs> and that everything <laughs> stays open so we can yeah. do so, you yeah, know, because it, it sucks for us and it sucks for people buying tickets. Yeah. You know, it's you just like... a lot of work and we, we just want you to be able to buy a ticket. We want to be able to play and we just want to go back to just, you know, Yeah. regular old it's, doing shows it will be amazing to have you playing here it's like gonna be fantastic and I with the new it. ep too it's gonna be great yeah. to see the new songs and a mix of the old songs too it's like it's gonna be fantastic yes. okay so thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you okay it was great we're thank very happy we're 
very happy for the return to like uh, it, it's good to have an old band like violence jamming again hey, what's giving that us old stuff buddy <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much for this thank opportunity. You very much, okay. Barry. I thank like, you, man. I really appreciate it. You guys were great. And, and you I'll really send you the itinerary when we're coming down. And yeah. we'll be in touch for sure. So you guys come out yeah. to the show and I'll make sure you get take care of. Yeah, for sure. We'll All be right. there. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank All you right. very Have much. Have a culture talk. Thank Subscribe you, to the channel. Bye. Yep. All right. Bye bye. It was great. <laughs>